Well, turn, turn with me to the book of Proverbs, the book of Proverbs chapter 1. We'll begin in verse 8. And can a book so, so ancient and so curious as Proverbs have something to say to each of us on this Christmas day? I believe it does. And, and I, I believe it does because the Lord Jesus warned us. He said, man, woman, child, no one shall live for bread alone. No one should live for the food that perishes, but to draw life from every word that proceeds from the mouth of God, including this passage from Proverbs that we'll be looking at today. So reading in the English Standard Version, Proverbs chapter one, starting in verse eight. Hear, my son, your father's instruction, and forsake not your mother's teaching, for they are a graceful garland for your head and pendants for your neck. My son, if sinners entice you, do not consent. If they say, come with us, let us lie and wait for blood. Let us ambush the innocent without reason. Like Sheol, let us swallow them alive and whole like those who go down to the pit. We shall all find precious goods and we shall fill our houses with plunder. Throw in your lot among us. We will all have one purse. My son, do not walk in the way with them. Hold back your foot from their paths, for their feet run to evil, and they make haste to shed blood. For in vain is a net spread and in the sight of any bird, but these men lie in wait for their own blood. They set an ambush for their own lives. Such are the ways of everyone who is greedy for unjust gain. It takes away the life of its possessors. Would you pray with me? Our God and Father, Lord, we thank you for your word, that the whole of your word, Father, is the, the, the necessary means by which we draw near to Christ by faith, Lord. Uh, I pray, Lord, for, for each one here, that even as we ponder these words, Father, that your spirit would penetrate our hearts, Lord, would give us hearts that believe and to trust in your word and draw near to Christ through faith in him. As we feed on this word, Father, we ask these things for your glory and honor and praise. We, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. It is Christmas Day. And I'll ask you, what do you hope to find under your tree? What do you hope to find? Now, some of you have traditions. <laughs> some of you have traditions where you open up a single present on Christmas Eve. So you've already gotten a little peek at the goods. Um, some of you may have already opened gifts. And some of you are waiting very patiently for when you get to go home and start to open things up. So f for me, I'll tell you, there's a couple cautionary tales I will share this morning. One, uh, this first one I'll share. Uh, as a young child, I could not wait for Christmas Day. And I mean that quite literally. I mean it quite literally, sadly. Days before Christmas, I would search the house high and low, top to bottom. I would look in every nook and cranny knowing that there were gifts that were hidden and I, I just couldn't help myself. Or better, I didn't want to help myself. I had to find those gifts and I had to look at them and I had to, to just find this buried treasure. So I did everything I could and once I found them, oh my, there was such joy in my heart. Just actually for a few moments, for a very few moments, until I, re I realized that there's a problem with stolen treasure. There's a problem with stolen treasure. Once, once you, you have it, there's this immediate burst of joy, and then there's this recognition of, well, what, what can I do with this knowledge? I have these gifts. I can't tell anybody about it. I can't play with them. I've got to wait, so I've got to put them all back. So why did I do this? And I, I did it more than once, sadly. So that tells you how how untrainable I, I seem to have been. It, that knowledge really did more harm than good in the moment. But, but these were just Christmas gifts. 
And life is much more than just Christmas gifts. There's hopes, there's dreams, there's plans, there's desires, there's things that we, we desperately want, we dearly want. These are the things that, that we would do anything for in order to have. These are the things that we, we devote our attention, our energy, all of our resources to get because they're so important to us. Well, as I, as I ceased my pre-Christmas raid of the home to try to find these gifts, as I, as I ceased that and I thought to myself, let me look outwardly, let me, let me look to my parents and ask my parents, what would you like for Christmas? And so I'm, I'm trying to look beyond myself. I'm trying to see what can I do to bless my parents? And so I'd ask them, what can I get you for Christmas? And they would always answer the same way. They would say, Sammy, we only want one thing. We just want you to obey us. <laughs> and I think, well, you know, I was willing to pay for this gift, but that's far more than I want to pay. <laughs> that's far more than I want to give. So I said, but I, I mean, what can I buy for you? Like, no, it didn't, it just didn't work. It didn't go over. You see, the gifts I wanted were gifts without a relationship. They were treasures without ties. They were a relationship without responsibility. And in my sinful way of thinking, I thought my parents should provide the resources and I should get to enjoy that, completely disregarding the relationship. But the Lord God said in Genesis 2, verse 18, he said, it is not good for the man to be alone. We are not made to live solitary lives. We are made to live in community because we're created in the image of the triune God who himself is Father, Son, and Spirit, who is community in and of himself. So we're made for a relationship, and that's why the best gifts come through a relationship. And so we'll consider three things in this short passage from Proverbs. We'll consider how wisdom is relational. Wisdom is relational. Temptation, however, is tailor-made. And lastly, wealth is offered. So wisdom is relational. So we see the book of Proverbs found in relationship to four other books really centrally placed in your English Bibles. From Job to the Song of Solomon, we have five books that are called poetry. And the, these poetic books give us a sense of, of God's artistic way of making his word and making it real to us, bringing it to bear on our lives. It's not that there's not poetry in other places of the Old and New Testament, but these are centrally placed. And within this poetry, we find wisdom. We find the books of wisdom. Uh, Proverbs is the, the, just the practical application of the word of God to everyday life. Wisdom is gained in a relationship. It's particularly in a vital relationship, a living relationship with the Lord God himself. Remember the key verse that we looked at the last time when we began Proverbs, Proverbs 1, verse 7. The fear of the Lord, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. The fear of the Lord. Now, this is not a fear that causes us to draw away from the Lord God. This is actually a fear that moves us closer to the Lord God. It's a fear in which we see the Lord God as in all of his, all of his splendor, all of his majesty. It's a fear that motivates us to move towards him, to worship him in spirit and truth. So the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Without this fear, it's simply information that we are seeking. It's simply information we're seeking for our own betterment. And this wisdom won't come, the wisdom that we desperately need won't come apart from a relationship. 
In, in the most, most natural setting, in Proverbs chapter 1, verse 8, the most natural setting is where we find wisdom shared in a relationship. And that comes through a relationship with our parents. Right? Verse 8, hear, my son, your father's instruction. Forsake not your mother's teaching. Because we live in a fallen world, parents will not model this relationship or this wisdom uh, perfectly. And, and sadly, some parents are going to fall far less short than others. And so, and so that's a grief. But, but even in, in the imperfect modeling of, of a father and a mother to a child, it, it moves us to look beyond this earthly world. It moves us to look to a heavenly father that can give us the perfect wisdom in a perfect relationship, in, in the, the very care and love that we need to find. So no matter how good or how bad your relationship is with your parents, it should move you to look beyond, beyond that, to find God's perfect relationship through faith in his son, Jesus Christ. The invitation, uh, my son, is given uh, three, three times in this short section. It's first given positively. We see here in verse 8, hear, my son, your father's instruction. Hear. Now, it's one thing to have the words go in one ear and out the other, but in, in the Hebrew, when we, when we see the word here, when we recognize that word here, we're talking more of listening, we're talking receiving those words, embracing them, treasuring them, making them a part of who we are, and certainly responding in obedience. To hear, for, for a son to hear is to do all of that and more, to embrace that instruction, to treasure it. But then you also see the, the complementary, the, the negative in verse 8, forsake not your mother's teaching. So hear and forsake not. So equally, complementary, you see the two of them together, the necessity of the two of them. Don't turn away from instruction from godly mothers and fathers. Don't turn away, especially when that teaching is hard to hear, when that teaching contains a, an element of rebuke, rebuke or correction, right? That's when it's hardest to hear. I might be okay listening and, and abiding by something that I agree with, but what happens when I don't like what I heard? What happens when I, I'm not excited about the instruction I'm given? That's the true test of whether I'm embracing it. Notice also that the instruction is given through the image of God. Mankind is made in the image of God. Male and female, God created them. And so you see both the father and the mother equally important, equally giving the instruction to the child. But realize that this is more than just biology. The command to honor your father and your mother is one that speaks of a relationship that goes beyond biology. The son that's receiving this, this wisdom, this instruction, the child that's receiving it may be biological, but could also be adoptive, could be spiritual. It could be in a civic or a church or a communal setting. So it's, it's speaking in regards to those who are above, to those who are under, subordinate to. The command speaks of bosses to employees, teachers to students, mayors or police officers to community members, elders to church members. It's a broad command. So don't just think of that biological relationship of parents to children, because honor your father and mother goes beyond that. It's broadly speaking to those who are above, to those who are subordinate. Now, why is God given wisdom to be received in this relationship? Well, look at verse 9. For, or because, 
because they are a graceful garland for your head and pendants for your neck. Graceful garland for your head, pendants for your neck. Now that doesn't at first glance seem very inviting or very interesting. Why do I want graceful garland on my head, pendants on my neck? What's the point? And as you look at the different translations, it's interesting, here's where the poetry really comes into play. Because the ESV and the NIV speak of garland and pendants, but the New American Standard speaks of a wreath upon the head. It speaks of necklaces around the neck. The New King James Version speaks of an ornament upon the head and chains. So this is a, this is a dressing up. This is a, I want to I wanna dress for success kind of thing. So it's on my head and it's on my neck. So this is something that seems, at first glance, something that, that would draw attention to me. So think about this. All clothing goes beyond fashion and outward appearances. Really, all clothing, the way we dress, it speaks to how do I want to be viewed by others? What do I want them to value as they look at me? Well, think about, think about this, another cautionary tale. So this comes out of the Old Testament in 1 Kings 12 or 2 Chronicles chapter 10. The cautionary tale of King Rehoboam. And this speaks to wisdom, and it speaks to the, where we look for wisdom and to whom we shall look for that wisdom. King Rehoboam became king after Solomon's death. One of Rehoboam's first challenges in leadership was how do I work with Jeroboam? Jeroboam had been exiled to Egypt. He would fled to Egypt during Solomon's reign because he was a threat to Solomon. And so Jeroboam told King Rehoboam after Solomon's death, he said, King Rehoboam, Solomon put us under forced labor, made our lives so difficult and so hard. Please Jeroboam appeals to King Rehoboam, please lighten the, the hard service of your father on us, and we will serve you. We'll do everything you say. King Rehoboam asks for three days to consider this counsel. Now, where does he go to first? He goes to the old men. He goes to the wise men. He goes to the fathers. And he says, what should I do? They told Rehoboam, Treat Jeroboam's people well, and they will always serve you. So in other words, comply with their request. Lighten their load. They will serve you. You won't ever have to worry about that. But then what does he does? The Bible records how King Rehoboam abandoned the counsel of the wise men. He abandoned it, and who did he take up counsel with? The young men he had grown up with. These are the guys I knew. These are the guys I hung out with. These are the guys I, I'm going to trust. I'm going to go all in for them. So what he ended up doing was making life even harder for Jeroboam's people. And, and this mistake would ultimately lead to the downfall of his kingdom. See, Christian, do not underestimate the power of your enemies. The world, the flesh, and the devil are always seeking to undermine your walk with the Lord and to, to try to throw a monkey wrench into, into the kingdom of God, if, if, if it could. Each of these enemies will whisper, you don't need wise counsel. You don't need to go to the wise ones. Just value the wisdom that you have in relationship to godly mothers, to godly fathers. The temptation is to listen to people who you like, to listen to people who are like you, rather than to listen to godly wisdom that's given through the word of God. A wise father and mother, wanting to give wisdom within a relationship to their child, were warn their child not to consent or to give in to temptation because they have, by virtue of their experience, by virtue of their knowledge, they're so much more heavily invested in their children than even their children are. But see, when you're, when you're in the child's 
position, um, it's hard to see that. And so it takes an element of trust to know that the Lord God is working in and through this. See, wisdom is gained in a relationship, but we must see and heed the important warning that temptation is tailor-made. Although the best gifts come through a relationship, a corollary to this is that the greatest hardships are also going to be experienced in relationship. So just like the best gifts come in a relationship, the greatest hardships will also come through relationship. And so the temptation is, maybe I should just avoid relationships if things are this hard. Um, but we're not made to live as solitary people. What are the characteristics of a, of a tailor-made temptation? So look, look in Proverbs 1, verses 11 through 16. So the father and the mother say, if, if sinners come to entice you, they'll say things like this, come with us, come with us. So that invitation, join our group, join in with us. You're going to be part of us. You're going to have, you're going to have importance. You're going to have value. If you become part of us, we'll, we'll help you find significance in life. Come with us. So they're going to give inviting words. They're going to give you words that draw you in. The temptation also promises great gain. Verse 13, we shall all find precious goods. We shall fill our houses with plunder. See, this is the thing that's going to be enticing. This, this, seeming, this promise of value, this promise of treasure. Come and get this. And then the offer is going to sound good, but notice how the tempters are in a hurry to close the deal. Verse 16, their feet run to evil. They make haste to shed blood. Experts will tell us that this is a huge red flag in relationships. Generally speaking, a relationship is gonna feel safe when the person to whom you're interacting with, they're following your lead, they're, they're listening to your concerns. They're valuing your ideas, your thoughts. And they're valuing you as a person, rather than trying to move you or sell you toward some solution that they think is going to be the best. Even moms and dads can fall into this temptation because we can see things more clearly than our children. And sometimes the temptation of, of us as parents is rather than try to train the child to understand and to learn these things, we try to close the deal too quickly. We try to push it, right? And that, that never brings the best result. The sinful nature of every person runs deep, even the Christian, particularly the Christian. And so we tend to think more highly of ourselves than we ought. We think we'll see the temptation coming. We'll think we can mitigate it somehow. We think the sinner that we see in verse 10, the sinner is going to show up in a black cape or he's going to have horns. He's going to be really easy to see. We're going to, we're going to be able to see it a mile away rather than recognize that, that temptation is tailor-made because it appeals to your sinful nature. It, it appeals to what's deep down, that, that nature that, that is bent against the kingdom of God. On this day, Christians the world over celebrate the birth of our Savior and Lord, who is Jesus. And a principal reason that the only begotten Son of God entered into the world was to die for sin, to take upon himself the wrath of God and to take the punishment that is due for every sin. The Bible says, 1 Corinthians 15, 3, for I delivered to you as of first importance that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. Christ died once for all for sin, and yet I see a continual temptation in, in myself and in others to want to die for our own sins. And, and what do I mean by that? Well, there, there's two principal ways people reject Jesus Christ and his atonement. The first is through punishment, and the second is through performance. 
So either through punishment or performance, we actively will reject Christ's sacrifice, his work. Either I'll, I'll punish myself for the things that go wrong, or I'll try to perform my way to some standard that is acceptable to the people around me or to myself. So I'll either punish myself for sin, or I'll try to perform my way out of it. And both are failures out of the gate because it's a rejection of what Christ has done, the gift that he's given us. He offers the gift of forgiveness, and that gift is wrapped and placed under the tree of life. You receive that gift by faith in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, the true wisdom and power of God. Forgiveness is a gift that comes in relationship to a heavenly father through faith in his son, Jesus Christ, as applied by the Holy Spirit to your lives. This is the only way we receive that forgiveness. Now, forgiveness, as I said, is a gift that only comes through relationship. But consider even a, even a minor offense. A friend tells you that she will meet you on Tuesday at 1230, and you're you're waiting for her at the duly appointed location that you're going to meet at. And it's 12.30 and it's 12.40 and it's 12.50. And then you finally get this text that says, I am so sorry. I was delayed. I, 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 can we reschedule? I, I'm not going to be able to get there. Now think about how do you respond to that request? I'm sorry. Can we reschedule? You might say, it's no problem at all. Don't worry about it. We'll reschedule it, right? You might say, no worries. We'll, we'll, catch, it. we'll catch up on another day. Or that all-famous response, you might say, it's all good. Don't worry about it, right? But this person has said, I am sorry. How can you give them the gift of forgiveness Unless and until you say, I forgive you. I forgive you. And you might say, well, it's just such a small thing. I just wanted them to know it wasn't a big deal. Well, if you want to truly lift the burden that they're carrying, is you say, I forgive you. You see, the Lord Jesus Christ died so that we can give that gift to one another not only to have that, that gift of forgiveness so that we can have fellowship with the Lord Jesus Christ eternally, but so that we could give that gift to each other. So to say, I forgive you, no matter how large or small the debt, is to give the greatest gift of all through the Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. The gift of forgiveness is only possible through Christ Jesus. We've seen how wisdom is received in a relationship and temptation is tailor-made, but let's close out this message as we consider the wealth that is offered. The wealth that is offered. Figuratively speaking, God placed gifts under the tree of life. The gift of forgiveness we've looked at through trusting the Lord Jesus Christ alone. But there's also gifts of joy. There's gifts of peace. Right? These would be called inward comforts. No matter what my, my outward condition, these gifts are available all the time through faith in a Savior who is Jesus Christ. But the temptation is to settle for life on my own terms and to, to receive and to find imitation gifts rather than the real thing that the Lord offers. The sinners who make haste to shed innocent blood were ultimately responsible for the death of Jesus Christ, of whose birth we celebrate this day. Right, Romans 3, verse 25 says, For God put forward this one, this man, as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith, to be received by faith, by refusing the counsel of Proverbs, 
we put ourselves in a place of rejecting this offer of the Lord Jesus. Verses 17 through 19 show us the trap that sinners are setting for others ultimately falls upon their own head. For in vain is a net spread in the sight of any bird, but these men lie in wait for their own blood. They set an ambush for their own lives. See, what they think they're gaining is actually going to evaporate. They won't have what they think is so valuable. Verse 13 tells us of these precious goods. And, and think about them in terms, again, of, of the things that you value, the things that are most important to you. The Hebrew expresses this phrase, precious goods, as something that is rare, something that is splendid, it's weighty, it's great wealth, it's something that, that you truly value and you, you prioritize above anything else. It's more than just the physical object. But people, you and I, right, will settle for less than what the Lord offers when we hold on to priorities that are greater than him or when we use his name in vain as a curse rather than the blessing that it truly is or when we fail to care for our neighbor when we have the means to help them within our own hand. If you have this sinking feeling that not only have you sinned, but that you yourself are a sinner, then you can recognize that the brokenness that's within you, the brokenness that you're experiencing, it can only be solved through the Lord Jesus Christ. They can only be, re be resolved through faith in his name. The, the good news, the, the people who are blessed are the ones who recognize that they're spiritually poor. They have broken the commandments of God and they mourn over that and yet they find the, the redemption, they find the forgiveness, they find the love that only the Lord Jesus Christ can offer through him. See, there's no shortcuts to a relationship. And that was made clear when Luke Skywalker and Yoda had this significant interaction. Um, Skywalker asked Yoda, he said, is the dark side stronger? And what did Yoda say? He said, no, quicker, easier, more seductive. See, the shortcuts, the shortcuts are only found through the dark side, through neglecting the kingdom of God, through turning from what the Lord God has planned for each of us. But the relationship that he offers, the good news that he gives us, is that to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. Would you pray with me? Our God and Father, Lord, we thank you that the power of God, the wisdom of God, comes only through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we pray that you would exalt his name, Father, in the lives of each one that is here in my own life even, Father. Let us see more of Christ as we look to him by faith in his word. Lord, we thank you that this day that you have made, Lord, we can rejoice and be glad. Thank you that you are with us. We pray, Father, glorify your name. Amen.